Good evening. Hold on. I'm just going to hold it in my hand. Um, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, students, graduates, professionals as well. Um, I am proud uh, to open tonight's first official event of International Perspective. Um, I'm, it's, it's even a greater pleasure uh, to welcome all of you to our first event. Uh, we thank you for taking your time to being here, and we hope that you have a, um, a good evening and that you learn a lot. Now, first a little bit about International Perspective. Um, hopefully most of you know that uh, we support the personal development of students and graduates looking for a career in international affairs. Uh, we started out with a magazine in September, and that was, that's rather successful. And now I'm glad to see that we're expanding our goals and our means to now our very first event. Thanks to Wert. Thank you. Um, and also other projects such as, for example, CV8, which we seek to launch in September, and it's uh, a guide hosted by a guide on um, how to improve your resume as a young professional. It's um, led by Flor, who's outside, unfortunately, right now. Um, but we hope to launch that by September and hope to help you further with that as well. Now, um, the event that we're hosting tonight, um, it's the first among hopefully several, including workshops, lectures, uh, debates, networking events, and so forth. Um, and as I said, it's thanks to Wert that we're uh, sitting here right now. Um, but International Perspective and its events and all other activities that we host are all possible thanks to volunteers. So I would also hereby like to welcome any of you, uh, students or graduates, to help us in our endeavor to join International Perspective. So if you're interested, feel free to check out our joint page on the website or to have a discussion or a talk with me or any other IP member after today's um, lecture. Um, as for the topic, the crisis in the Central African Republic, um, it's a forgotten conflict, conflict in an almost equally forgotten, uh, on an almost equally forgotten conf um, Continent, sorry. Um, it's, it may sound very cliche, but it's, it's the truth. Nowadays, people are very preoccupied with the conflicts in Syria, with the crisis in Ukraine and so forth. And we instead wanted to offer you an insight, a first, uh, first idea of um, another cr crisis in Africa. Um, so we want to inform you about other global issues uh, which also require our attention, because a crisis or a conflict is not determined by the absolute number of refugees or the, um, murdered people and so forth. It's determined by the fact that people are suffering, be they women, uh, children, men, and so forth. So that's where, why we're going to have a lecture on the crisis in the Central African, African Republic. And our speaker will be Yannick Wens. Um, Yannick Wens is a researcher at the International Peace Information Service or IPIS for short. Um, he did research in the DRC um, firstly, so the Democratic Republic of Congo. And now he went to uh, the, the Central African Republic recently. He did research about the motives and uh, uh, things that are driving the, the uh, armed groups over there, if I'm correct. There you go. Um, so now he's going to share us um, his opinion, his insight on what he learned there. And um, I think that's the most important thing for me to say. Um, afterwards, the lecture will be about an hour, I think. Um, there will be time for questions. So if you have any further questions, don't hesitate to ask them. And feel free to ask us any questions afterwards as well. Thank you very much, Yannick Wens. Give him a warm, up, a warm welcome. OK, many, many thanks, Joran, for the kind introduction. Many thanks for being here. Uh, I think it's a very good initiative, the international pr perspective. Uh, I think, of course, that the Central African Republic is an excellent choice for the first event. And I recently learned that this is the first event, so it's a bit of my responsibility to make it a good one. So I hope you'll enjoy it. Um, so International Perspective, they uh, shared this picture here. They sent this picture out. So actually, this is um, a picture of the largest IDP camp, so interne internally displaced people's camp, in Bangui, in the capital. So it's right next to the airport. And if you, so here you can see the airport. So when you fly into Bangui, you can see the entire camp of refugees, those are Muslim IDPs. OK, so first, a little word about my organization and maybe about myself. Uh, so I'm working for the International Peace Information Service. It's a, an independent research institute that is based here in Antwerp, actually just right across the corner. So that was 
easy and convenient for me. Uh, so we do research on sub-Saharan Africa. So we're mainly specialized in the DRC, in the Central African Republic, uh, Sudan, South Sudan, and Burundi. So um, I've been visiting all these countries uh, to do exactly what? To do uh, conflict mapping and analysis. So actually I make maps of all the different conflict regions um, for donors such as the World Bank, uh, for other international organizations such, such as IOM, also for the Belgian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And so we go there and we try to actually establish maps, for instance, in the DRC of all the different mining areas and the control of armed forces and armed groups over the mining areas. And in uh, the Central African Republic, for instance, we try to make maps to see what the conflict dynamics are and what the control of the different armed forces and groups is, what their strategy is. And based on that strategy, we actually try to analyze what the motivations are, what the real conflict drivers are behind the conflict. So this is a, a, very, a very short uh, overview of the conflict mapping theory. Uh, I think it's going to be more condensed than this. So actually, the motives of an armed group of, of an, or an armed movement will actually define their objectives in warfare. And this will then become clear in the specific actions they make on the ground. So we are actually trying to trace back these different elements to come to the motivations. And this is then actually something that we share with uh, the international community. So for policymakers for, uh, to make their decisions. So of course, we, we work closely together with uh, UN missions. And also, for instance, the World Bank actually commissioned the study that I did in 2014 in the Central African Republic, and they were trying to see actually where exactly they had to orient their uh, assistance programs. Okay, I found this very basic map of the Central African Republic, but I think it's, it's a clear one. Um, so the Central African Republic, if it were not for its name, I think that it, most people would have difficulties finding it on a map. It's indeed a little bit lost in between, on the one hand, the, the Sahel region, uh, and on the other hand, more the, uh, the central, Af real central Africa, so more tropical um, Af Africa, such as the DRC. We see that it we see that it's surrounded by all these not so stable countries. So we see the DRC, we see South Sudan, Sudan, where a lot of conflicts are actually taking place. Chad, not the most stable country either, and then we've got Cameroon as well. So the Central African Republic being wedged in between. Um, the Sahel and the, the more tropical region, the more um, Bantu region, let's say, of, of Africa. We can see that actually here in the... Okay, so actually, if, if we take a look a little bit at uh, the, the population in the Central African Republic, we see that here in the north, like this, this area, the northeast, is actually a region that is more influenced by Muslim influences, by Sahel influences. And of course, there will be more Muslim people there, and the specific role of religion in this conflict, we, that's something that we will endeavor upon later on. And then here we have more the southern region, which is not, not as influenced by this Muslim Arabic cu culture as the, north the northeastern region. Okay, so giving an introduction on the Central African Republic, I think it's, it's pretty necessary to talk a little bit about the natural resources that we find there. Uh, so this is actually a screenshot of one of the interactive maps that we're making. I can give you a little presentation of those later on, if we still have the time. Uh, so in terms of natural resources in the Central African Republic, we see first of all, oh, so I will do it like this. Uh, so these are actually diamond mining areas. So we have two big diamond mining areas, one in the east, here, and then one in the west. And so all these yellow dots are actually gold mining sites. Uh, so all the mining exploitation in the, in the Central African Republic is almost, uh, almost entirely artisanal. Uh, so it's people really digging uh, along riverbeds to try to find the diamonds. Uh, and there is very little industrial exploitation going on. Actually here, this is an area where there is uranium ore to be found. And so uh, the French company Areva tried to develop a big uranium mining site there. But um, given, of course, the difficulties to operate in the Central African Republic and also the uh, downfall of the international uranium prices, th that's a project that actually went down the drain and with a lot of losses for, for uh, th the French company. And so here in the north, we actually see that there are, are a lot of um, uh, oil concessions. 
And so these are oil concessions that are not yet exploited. And there, there, there is exploration going on, so there are certain companies that have titles over these concessions. But of course, it will take a lot of investment to really make, uh, make this, uh, to really exploit this. Uh, and actually, so here, it's not that clear maybe on the map, but here is here you see the border. And these are all uh, oil concessions in southern Chad. So you can immediately see actually that they're pretty much linked. And of course, the politics of Chad and the Central African Republic were with regards to their border will be very uh, sensitive uh, and very much entangled with natural resources, for instance, in the, on, in the first place already. Um, so the Central African Republic being placed in between the Sahel and more the tropical areas, it is a very important uh, area where we see a lot of cattle migration. So actually during the dry season, there is a lot of migration from uh, Chadian pastoralists and from Sudanese pastoralists who actually go down to the south where there are still more rains and they actually migrate and they stay during the dry season in the Central African Republic, which of course can create these kinds of tensions with the local population. So here, like all these green areas that you see here, are actually areas where there are uh, cattle herders living. These are all uh, Mbororo pastoralists, which are also of more of a Muslim origin. So these are, as you can see, they're very pretty much uh, distributed to, throughout the entire country. And so these are actually already, this is a bit the, the groundwork already of maybe the ethnic composition and, and religious composition of the country. Uh, just one quick word as well on uh, the national parks and the poaching, so that you have maybe a bit of a, an idea. Uh, so the biggest natural parks are in the northeast, and these, all these red lines are actually uh, poaching routes. So there are a lot of Sudanese poachers who come into the Central African Republic to poach all kinds of large mammals, uh, elephants, antelopes, uh, leopards, everything. And so in the 1970s, according to estimates that were made back in the days, there would have been about 35,000 elephants living in this area. And the most recent estimate dating from 2010 or something, I, I guess. Uh, according to this estimate, there would still be around yeah, 100 to maybe 150 elements remaining, uh, elephants remaining. So they, they were pretty efficient, those poachers. It is also important in the sense that now in this, in this area, in terms of trying to conserve the little wildlife that was remaining, the European Union and a lot of other international actors actually started to train and equip local wildlife guards. And so these local wildlife guards, they were actually trained in kind of bush warfare to fight against these poachers. But of course, as a result, you had local strongmen who were living in this area and were well equipped. And these will, at a later stage, as we will see, these will have started to play a major role in the conflict that is now going on. Um, I, I already briefly touched upon the fact that, of course, the Central African Republic is kind of surrounded by countries that are not as stable, or maybe as stable as the Central African Republic, or a bit less. Um, so it's, it's very important to keep in mind this regional perspective as well. And so what this map actually shows is the routes that the LRA, so the Lord's Resistance Army, are actually following. So the LRA was originally based in northwestern Uganda. But there they were chased away by the Ugandan security forces and they were actually pushed. So this is, this is, north, this is northern DRC. They were actually pushed into northern DRC and from northern DRC they went into the eastern Central African Republic and they are still roaming around there and a lot of security related incidents are actually cause, caused by the LRA that is there. And so here you can see this is actually the Kafia Kinji enclave. It's a very, very remote area that is literally in between Sudan and South Sudan. So when South Sudan became independent from Sudan, this Kafia Kinji enclave was actually an area that is not, it's not yet decided whether it either belongs to Sudan or to South Sudan. So this is the perfect hideout area for the LRA and according to several sources, uh, Joseph Kony would be hiding in that area. 
Another element of this regional instability is actually the former feud between Chad and Sudan. Uh, so this is linked to the Darfur conflict, where actually Chad and Sudan were supporting proxy militia in each other's border region to fight against each other. And of course, northeastern Central African Republic, I hope it's a bit clear where this, this actually lies on the map, that you still have this mental image of the bit of an overview that I gave you. Um, so the northeastern region of the Central African Republic was actually used as some kind of a transit area by all these militia, really leading to regional instability and also actually uh, nurturing these local uh, tensions between different groups. Okay, so I hope I, I did set the scene a little bit on the CER, albeit very briefly. Um, so this is Emperor Bokassa, who was actually the first emperor and so far the only emperor of the Central African Republic. As you can see, he uh, had the idea that he was really reigning over an entire empire. And Bokassa actually was, uh, he came into power after the first coup. So the Central African Republic became independent from France in 1960. And then in 1965, Emperor Bokassa uh, took power by means of a, of a coup. Uh, as you can see, he had, um, yeah, he was uh, like a little bit crazy, maybe. <laughs> I don't know what the, the scientific term would be. But um, so he was actually in power for 14 years. And then, yeah, it became a bit better and better. And then at some point, the, the French authorities decided to support actually David Daco, so the first president, to take power again. So there already we have the second coup. Uh, uh, but al already two years later on, we had yet another coup of Kolingba. Uh, and then it is only in 1993 that there were the first elections. So then we have President Patassé. So in 1993, he was installed, but then in 1996, there were already army mutinies against him. So uh, people from the army who were still loyal to Kolingba, uh, who, or who wanted to actually uh, chase President Patassé away from power. So uh, in 2001, there was against, uh, again a foiled coup attempt. Um, and then in that time, so maybe you know Jean-Pierre Bemba, who is on trial in the International Criminal Court. He was actually, so he was, of course, a warlord or a rebel leader in the DRC, but he is now on trial in The Hague because of his role in actually squashing this coup attempt in Bangui in 2001. Um, the history repeat itse repeats itself. <laughs> in 2003, he had another coup of uh, President Bozizé, who was supported by Chad, by, Chad, uh, by that time. Um, and then, so we have Bozizé having been put in, into power. And then actually the, there was this kind of fog, uh, this, this phony war that started. So then we had in the Northwest, we had some kind of armed groups who still remained loyal to President Patassé and who were actually organizing these small scale attacks in the Northwest. And then in the Northeast, we started to have, uh, as you can remember, in this northern, this northernmost region, where we had these um, armed wildlife guards, these poachers, who were actually confronted with a lot of Sudanese armed elements who came passing through, who were um, also confronted with uh, Sudanese pastoralists. That, on top of uh, additional uh, ethnic tensions within North Eastern CAR. So there we actually have the perfect breeding ground for several local armed groups that actually uh, came into existence. Okay. So we have now, by, by 2004, 2008, we have a country where there is very, very little state control, where actually President Bozizé distrusts his own, his own army because of the history of army mutinies, because of still loyalties to former President Patassé, and actually his bodyguards were special forces that were given by the Chadian regime. So he, he was actually protected by Chadian uh, soldiers and not by his own. So there you can, of course, already imagine that the control that uh, he exerted over the country was very, very limited. 
also the, the presence or the, the, uh, any economic initiatives in trying to kickstart economic development in the hinterland were completely lacking. So again, the perfect breeding ground for these local disgruntled militia. Um, so in 2008, we had then the peace agreement whereby these local militia would be integrated again in the army, um, but that actually never happened. And what then happened in 2013, which is actually the start of the current crisis, was that these local militia, so, well, so in 2013, um, there was the advent of the Seleka. Uh, the Seleka actually started in their offensive in December 2012. So there we had in the Northeast, we had these armed groups, uh, this thing out of, on the one hand, these, these wildlife guards, these local strongmen, but also uh, assisted by a lot of unemployed mercenaries. As I, as I told you, there was this armed conflict, this proxy war going on between Chad and Sudan, and so there were a lot of mercenaries. But the relations between Sudan and Chad had sensibly increased, so we had all these armed people who were actually all of a sudden out of a job and out of a livelihood. So they were very easily recruited into the ranks of the Seleka to go into the CAR and start pillaging and start making a living, so to say. Uh, apart from these two categories, there were also the Chadian former liberators. So Bozizé, the then president in 2013 still, uh, was actually aided into power by the, with the support of Chad, and he was also uh, assisted by all kinds of Chadian mercenaries. And he made, them all kinds of he made them all kinds of promises that if he would come into power, he would, he would of course give them a lot of uh, material wealth and influence, but these promises he never kept. So, of course, there we have these disgruntled Chadian mercenaries, we have these unemployed mercenaries, we have these former um, park guards, and then we have a large population of very impoverished people, actually, who are mainly working in local diamond mining sites, who don't have with very little prospects of a decent living, so these were very easily recruited as well in the ranks of the Seleka. And the last um, stakeholder, let's say, within the, the Seleka were actually the diamond traders. So Bozizé was at some point, he, was, he had a very luxurious lifestyle, he went to Paris all the time in business class and spending a lot of money on the Champs-Élysées. And so at some point his regime was running out of power and he, they decided to, from one day to the other, actually um, not really attack, but to take control of all the diamond traders, of all the diamond houses, and to seize all the stocks of diamonds and gold and money that they had. Uh, and they were using this pretext of the fact that they were not really following all, re all, all regulations and stuff like that, but of course it was some kind of uh, a prise of the state of all this, this money. So then you, you had, of course, these diamond traders who were also actually very disappointed with the Bozizé regime and who then were mainly also Muslims. So they have, and they already had since a long time, these links with these northern, northwestern, uh, northeastern, sorry, northeastern rebel groups. So they started funding uh, the Seleka coalition. And so the head of the Seleka coalition was called President uh, Joto Dia. And so they moved from December 2012, they started moving towards Bangui. So this is, so in the beginning, they quickly took all, ki all of the major towns. They took the administration, so they started their own parallel administrations in all these areas. And with the Central African forces being almost inexistent and not being disciplined and not being paid and not being loyal, of course, to the regime, there was barely any resistance. Uh, so they could go very closely to the capital, in, uh, to the capital Bangui. They didn't take Bangui yet. There were some negotiations, but these negotiations failed. Of course, the Seleka was in, were in a very strong position, so they could just walk into town, so to say. So from March 2013, they had taken Bangui, and they also started to take, of course, the entire country. 
And as soon as they had done that, uh, well, this, so this is again a bit the overview of all the uh, natural resources of the mining sites. So actually what happened was that the Central, Afri uh, Central African Silica, they took control of this mining area. So they really exerted very strong organized control over this. So they had their own mining administration, they were issuing permits, they were taxing, and they were also pre-financing mining operations. So they were really making a lot of money from these areas. Here as well, there is a, a large gold mining site. They took control of, of the gold mining sites and they started levying taxes. Then in Bangui, there they started looting. There was large scale looting that was actually committed by the Seleka. Of course, we had these mercenaries. We have these former Chadian liberators. They weren't in there to really come into power or to try to get reforms, socio-economic reforms for the Central African people. They wanted, above all, to be paid. So they started looting in Bangui, and then these foreign Seleka, so mainly Chadians and Sudanese, they went to the Western region. So they went to the Western region, they took control over all the towns and the mining regions, and there, actually, the, the form of control that they exerted there was way more predatory. Of course, they were predatory as well, but here it was not as organized, so it was really very short term. So they started looting cattle, they started uh, looting entire, um, my entire mining sites, there was forced labor, and it was really like taking the spoils of war in as short a period as they could. Okay, so in terms of the conflict grievances, I know I'm going quickly, but I hope it's clear for everybody. Um, so in terms of the conflict motives, so of course when the Seleka started marching down to Bangui and started to make their demands, of course they were they were actually framing their um, their attack in terms of wanting to have socio-economic reforms. Of course, the lack of socio-economic activity and the lack of prospects for many of those um, foot soldiers that previously worked in the mining sites for, for very little money was, of course, a, a main root cause. But then if we go and look at the Seleka leadership, once they were into power, they didn't take any socio-economic initiative. There was not a single law that was enacted with socio-economic reforms in mind. Uh, they, they were very productive in the terms of uh, passing decrees, but all those decrees that were passed were all to appoint their friends within the army, within the administration, and of course to give concessions over mining sites to companies that gave them either briberies or companies that they could just extort money from. So another grievance, as I mentioned, was also the state-sanctioned pillaging of the diamond traders, which was also a grievance that they explicitly mentioned when they were marching down to Bangui and they wanted to be uh, all they wanted to have all their properties reinstated. The former liberators that left on that were left unpaid was as well something that they voiced themselves as a demand. So this, of course, already gives a clear indication of the, the type, the types of people and groups that were actually part of the Seleka coalition. Uh, and then, of course, this is hotly debated item, uh, religious grievances. To what extent does this really play a role within the current conflict? Uh, something which is very clear was that when the Seleka, mainly, mainly, being mainly a Muslim coalition, started to walk towards Bangui, they never voiced their concerns in religious terms. That is only something that came afterwards with the rise of the anti-Balaka, so the armed groups fighting against the Seleka. So for, at that point in time, there was nothing that was actually phrased in terms of religious tension. Um, so in terms of grievances, I already gave these indications that indeed some of the grievances contributed to the dynamics on the ground, but the main reason for the Seleka leadership to go and walk down on Bangui and take power was greed. Uh, so there was this widespread looting, there was this very quick and organized control that they started to take over these artisanal mining sites. Once they were in power, they really started to give all kinds of mining concessions 
to these companies they could get money from. And uh, when I was in Bangui, we kind of investigated the, the, the kind of mechanisms that they employed to, to get money and to keep all the decisionary power outside of the administration and to really keep it in their close circle of trusted Sileka commanders. Uh, another element as well, so as I, as I already mentioned, there is a lot of cattle in the country. And so what they also did was they started to steal cattle and they started to impose taxes on those herds. So again, parallel taxation. Uh, apart from uh, taxes on uh, miners, taxes on uh, pastoralists, they were very inventive when it came to uh, inventing new kinds of taxation. So there was also taxation for all uh, for import and export. So everything going into the country was taxed by the Seleka as well, um, for yeah, like a couple of thousand dollars for, for a truck, for instance. And then when there were several Seleka factions, they started offering to the traders uh, protection. They started providing an escort against payment, of course, to protect the, the traders and the, the convoys from additional harassment from other Seleka. Okay, so the party, of course, couldn't continue forever. Um, and so, just um, to, to repeat, so it was in March 2013 that the Seleka took power and that President Jotodja was instated. Then by August 2013, we saw that there were these kind of self-defense militia that started to form in the CAR. And they were calling themselves the anti-Balaka. Now, uh, etymologically, there are a lot of different um, ways in which you can explain anti-Balaka. So in the local language, Sango, Balaka would mean machetes, and so it would be anti-machetes. The, the thing is that the Seleka never really used machetes, so it's uh, an explanation that kind of falls short. Uh, another explanation is that actually it is anti-Balaka. So anti bal so against bullets of an AK-47. And that is, I think, a very good explanation in the fact that here you can see all these kind of amulets that they are wearing. So the anti balaka they believe that these amulets and, and the use of specific rituals would actually render them immune for uh, bullets. And that is also something that we see in the DRC with the Mai Mai militia, where Mai Mai means water, water in Swahili. Uh, and they also believe that actually the use of this kind of magic water would protect them against bullets if they follow a specific set of, of very strict behavioral rules. So who were these anti-Balaka? So on the one hand, of course, we had self-defense groups that started to arise in the Western Central African Republic, where, of course, there were less Muslims, so where the ethnic composition was different, uh, where also the kind of control exerted by the Seleka was more predatory, was way more violent, where it was more looting. And also in the West was actually the area, so around Bosangoa, uh, where uh, President Bozize came from. Uh, so we have on the one hand self-defense groups, uh, people from the armed forces or from the gendarmerie that started to join these self-defense groups. And then there were these attempts to organize these self-defense groups by people who were still loyal to President Bozize. And they wanted to overthrow the Seleka, uh, the Seleka uh, rule. So the Seleka, they, uh, the, the Antibalaka, sorry, they started first to attack around August. But then, uh, gradually, tension increased, and in December 2013, they staged a well-coordinated and large-scale attack in Bangui to chase the Seleka government away. Um, and from that moment onwards, things spiraled quickly out of control. So what you can see here are actually all uh, destroyed buildings. And these areas are exactly the Muslim uh, neighborhoods in Bangui. So apart from targeting the Seleka, 
the Antibalaka also started to, from the onset to target the Muslim civilian population. Yeah. Um, there were a lot of ethnic killings, uh, very cruel killings often, uh, with mutilations. And in these attacks, um, it's estimated according to Amnesty International that a thousand people would have, would have been killed. So from that moment onwards, the grievances and the conflict were really framed in terms of this religious tension, uh, whereas that's something that wasn't before. Um, so um, once the anti-Balaka really started to take control over Bengi or started to chase the Seleka uh, mil uh, militants away, they also started to take control of the west of the country. So the, the Seleka, so here we had all these foreign Seleka, so Chadian, Sudanese, and of course they, they already made sure that they had their spoils of war and they weren't really motivated to fight at their own risk of life against these uh, very uh, virulent uh, anti-Balaka forces. So they, they retreated. Um, so they retreated. And the anti-Balaka took control of this, over this area. In doing so, they really started to loot belongings of the entire population, but mainly of the Muslim population. And they started to target the Muslim population really with the intent either to, to chase them away or to kill them. Um, so here in the West, there are still Muslims, uh, Central, African, uh, Central African Muslims and uh, Muslim immigrants who were actually in control over the diamond trade often. So what we saw was that the local population was often working in the mining sites, on the, were often working on the mining sites as uh, diggers. So they really did the most low-level jobs. And when it came to the trade, uh, really commercializing the diamonds, where there is more money to be made, that was actually a trade that was in control of the Central African and foreign Muslim population. So the anti Balaka started to equate Seleka with Muslims, with Jadians, with foreigners, and they attacked all these different Muslim communities in the, the West. Uh, they also started to attack these um, Muslim, these Mbororo herders that live in the Central African Republic. Of course, this again is something that, instead of really framing it in religious terms, goes back to tensions that always exist between pastoralists and agriculturalists. Uh, so there were already tensions for quite some time, but now these fault lines between, on the one hand, religion, and on the other hand, agricult uh, agriculturalists and pastoralists, they kind of fell together. So the socioeconomic fault lines fell together with the religious fault lines, and this is why actually all of a sudden the conflict could get this um, religious uh, dimension. So here in the West, almost all the entire Muslim population fled. So actually, what you see here, these are all uh, IDP camps or refugee camps. So here, right across the border in Cameroon, you see that these are all refugee camps where the Muslim population is staying. Um, the anti-Balaka, when they took control over the West, they also started to take control over the mining sites. Uh, and they started to impose themselves and they really tried to um, take control over this diamond trade that before was out of their reach. Uh, but of course, because of the, f the previous pillaging and control of the Seleka, the diamond production already fell down. Secondly, the Antibalaka didn't have the necessary business network to be able to sell these diamonds. So there was no market anymore and production really fell steeply down. Uh, so what they could do was mainly taking control over the gold mining sites, because gold is very easy to, to sell and to commercialize and to make a profit of. So they were mainly in these gold mining areas. What the Antibalaka also did was actually um, looting or rustling the cattle. So whereas the Seleka were a bit more organized in the sense that they, they did tax the herders, 
um, and they also stole cattle sometimes, the Antibalaka started to uh, kill entire herds of cattle. So normally uh, a cow would be sold at a couple of hundred dollars a piece. And because they looted all the cattle, at some point they were trying, they were trying to sell these cows at a mere $15. So this gives you an idea of the kind of over offer, that w over supply that was being created by all, these, all this looting. Uh, and then you saw these entire streets that were just completely lined with people who were trying to sell smoked meat because they, they couldn't sell the, the cattle anymore. So they killed it and they, they smoked the meat and they were trying to sell it like this to make some money out of it. But now, of course, there is very little cattle left. Um, so the Seleka retreated from the, from the west, but they still remained here in the east, mainly Central African Seleka, who took control over these diamond mining areas, who were still remaining there, and then two other Seleka factions here and here. I will, I will tell you a little bit about it afterwards. And so here in red, is actually the area where there, is, where there are still regular clashes between Antibalaka elements and the Seleka. And so this is, it's of course not a coincidence why all these IDP camps are actually located in this, in this area. So the, just another word maybe on the, on the degree of structure and organization of the Antibalaka, it's way more fractured than the Seleka. The Seleka now are also fractured, but there we can really see that there are different groups that kind of are in, in control or under the command of certain specific leaders. But with the Antibalaka, it's way more heterogeneous. And we have these local strongmen that maybe are very strong, uh, that they really are uh, the undisputed commanders in a, in a certain area, in a small area, where they have developed their own uh, parallel networks where they either control the gold uh, trade, or where they control, for instance, uh, the, the rustling of cattle. But in the, the Seleka, by, by contra in contrast, are, are more structured. Okay. So the conflict motives for the, for the anti-Balaka. So on the one hand, yes, self-defense was gave the impetus, actually, this, this need or this, this wish to overthrow the Seleka regime, which, of course, was a very abusive regime. Um, but from the onset onwards, their actions really went way beyond what we could call self-defense. Uh, so these large-scale targeted ethnic killings and clashes uh, indicated there were, there were these socio-economic grievances that were actually phrased in religious terms. Greed motives also played a part uh, with a lot of looting, profit from artisanal mining and cattle rustling. And of course, you have to see that a lot of the foot soldiers of the Antibalaka were actually people who were before working in the diamond mines. And with the production in the, in the diamond mines completely to its standstill, they of course saw the prospect of looting as an alternative way to make sure they could eat in the evening. Okay, so the, the current situation, uh, very, very briefly. Um, so the East is still, it, it's difficult to say whether it's under control or it's an area under influence. In some areas, the Seleka still have this parallel administration and where there is very little international presence of the MINUSCA mission, for instance. Um, in others, they, they are more in the remote areas. But this entire region is actually still under influence of different Seleka factions. So the Seleka, which means union in Sango, uh, were unified in the beginning when they marched down to Bangui, but then immediately afterwards they started to fall apart as well. So now actually we have one, um, one faction here, um, which is of one ethnic group predominantly of the Runga, and then there is another faction here uh, of the Kula. So those are two Central African uh, ethnic groups, and then here, this area is actually in control of two other Seleka factions, uh, but maybe a foreign or other Seleka factions. So here we have a group that is actually commanded by a Pearl commander, so of these Mbororo pastoralists. And he has control over 
over these mining sites and he's really making a lot of money out of parallel taxation so all the Sudanese traders who come to the Central African Republic to take uh, coffee with them or text and uh, I heard from from Minuska that it's actually a very organized and structured system and in return he provides some kind of security and then here in the north we have more Chadian uh, silica and they are mainly making money out of uh, attacking uh, cattle so in this entire border region there are a lot of uh, there is a lot of cattle coming in from from Chad or even local cattle, and they are looting. Uh, they are uh, they are attacking these uh, herds. Here is yet another armed group upon which I will not uh, embark today. Uh, Revolution et Justice. Um, so this was actually an armed group of a very um, opportunistic uh, rebel leader. So he wanted to use a rebel group just as a means to gain political influence. And so in the beginning it was with the Seleka, and then when he saw that he wasn't, wasn't going to get uh, the political positions that he wanted with the Seleka, he started to support the anti-Balaka. Uh, and then in the end he became the uh, Minister of Sports and Youth um, in the transitional government in a, in a bit to appease him. And if you take a look, actually the three last ministers of sports and youth were always these... Uh, re rebel leaders that they were trying to put in some kind of a political position without giving them too much power. So it's uh, a bit the, low, the lowest ranking ministry. Uh, and now apparently, so this this uh, Re Revolution and Justice group has some kind of an arrangement with the Seleka to uh, um, to uh, rustle cattle together. So the West is mainly cleared from an active anti-Balaka presence. So there was this big upsurge in violence, but then, I, but then as soon as everything was more or less looted, as soon as more or less all the Muslims were either, uh, either, fled, across, or either fled across the border or were stuck in these enclaves in the different uh, towns, and they were seeing that, yeah, they, they were not gaining any more money, so they were trying to pick up their daily activities again. Uh, also because, of course, the anti-Balaka was not really a very organized structure. Uh, so the control in the West was re-established quicker. And there is also a stronger international presence of the several um, UN mission, of the UN mission, for instance. Um, so I, I just came back from a mission to the Central African Republic where I had to analyze the security situation uh, in the western diamond region. And uh, so I traveled by car all the way from Bangui to here and then all the way back. And yeah, the situation has really stabilized. There was no anti-Balaka presence that we could see. Of course, there is still a problem with the proliferation of small arms. So a lot of those people have are now working in the mining sites again. They are trying to eke out an existence, digging for diamonds, although there is still uh, a huge issue with those diamonds. Um, I will I will embark on upon that a little later. Um, but of course, there is a lot of proliferation of small arms, so which constitutes a serious security risk. Um, in response to the crisis, um, the Central African Republic was suspended from the Kimberley process. So I don't know. I, I think that maybe most of you will have heard of the Kimberley process, which is actually um, an intergovernmental organization uh, between diamond producing and um, uh, ex exporting or commercializing countries. Um, and every country that wants to export diamonds has to give this Kimberley certificate to demonstrate that these diamonds are not produced in a way that contributes to an armed conflict. Of course, here in the DRC, given all the background that I just gave you, about the control of the Seleka and Antibalaka over the diamond mining areas. Of course, the Central, Afri Re Central African Republic became suspended from the Kimberley process and was no longer allowed to uh, export any diamonds. Um, but production continued, albeit at a very low, s low level, uh, because normally, so you have these diamond traders, so the, the buying houses, who buy the diamonds and they export them to, uh, in most cases, Antwerp. But of course, they sell the diamonds, they export, they sell the diamonds in Antwerp, they get cash, and with this cash, 
they go and pre-finance new mining sites on the ground. So in terms of providing food for the people who have to dig, providing fuel, all these kind of, of uh, resource intensive activities. Uh, and of course, because now these buying houses can no longer export the diamonds, they don't get the money. So there is a huge cash flow issue. So they cannot pre-finance mining operations on the ground. So this is of course why there is very little activity and why those uh, miners make barely any any money and most of the diamond my, uh, most of the diamonds that are still found are actually smuggled across the border into eastern cameroon uh, because a lot of those muslim diamond traders that had to flee uh, literally set up shop right across the border so they can still buy diamonds uh, and then export them through unofficial channels uh, and then here this is actually the entire region where there is a lot of LRA activity. Uh, well, that's a bit, um, and so there is a resurgence now in LRA activity, apparently. Okay, I'll just take some water. Okay, so international perspective also asked me to talk a little bit about the international response, um, which is of course interesting, but it's it's a, it's a, a very uh, it's a topic of course that does deserve a lot of attention and another one hour presentation, um, and I don't know whether I will keep your attention for that long. Um, so this is actually um, a pickup truck of the MINUSCA of the UN mission that is currently. Uh, keeping the peace or trying to keep the peace in the Central African Republic. But if we take a look at the volume or the number of peacekeeping missions that already went to the CAR and left the CAR before MINUSCA, it's, uh, it's pretty impressive. I don't know whether there is an official list of the countries with the most international peacekeeping missions, but I, I think that the CAR is really a contender for the title. So, um, so the first UN mission actually started back in 1998, so the MINURCA, so which was maybe, as you recall, so we had uh, Patase, who came into power after, the ele after elections, so the first democratic elections. And then in 1996, there were these mutinies of the army. So he actually asked the, the United Nations whether they could provide support for peacekeeping when the elections were about to take place in 1998. So in, MINURCA was deployed in 1998 for securing the elections and, and really trying to, trying to consolidate this democratic process. Uh, with the elections back then, had come as they went well, uh, according to the observers, time of course would prove otherwise, um, they established the BONUCA. So whenever, so you have often these UN missions, so when they say mission in the title, it is actually a peacekeeping operation, which means that there will be military personnel deployed on the ground. When they talk about a bureau, donc bureau de l'Organisation des Nations Unies on RCA, hein, BONUCA, then it's actually a political mission. So there it's mainly uh, political advisors who are trying to um, contribute to peace building activities, so no military component to them. And so you will often see, uh, once they, there, were, there have been elections with a peacekeeping mission, after a little while they will, they will scale it down and they will turn it into a political mission. They did the same thing in Burundi, uh, and now they will may, maybe make, make it a, a peacekeeping mission with soldiers again. Um, so we have several different actors. So we have the UN pillar, so this is, these were the first UN missions. And then we also have peacekeeping missions of the African Union or the uh, Communauté Économique des États de l'Afrique Centrale, so which is a regional intergovernmental organization in Central Africa. Um, and so the FOMUC was deployed after the, um, the foiled coup attempt wherein Bemba was implicated, so there was large scale, there was really uh, extensive violence in Bangui. And so then the, the regional organization actually established 
a peacekeeping mission under the auspices of the African Union. Uh, in 2008, there were these um, there were these peace agreements. So I, I told you about these local armed groups that came into being trying to fight the regime of Bozizé, so in the west, so these former Patassé loyalists, and then in the east, these armed groups of these um, diamond traders and of these um, 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 wi wildlife guards who would then continue and actually start be at the basis of, of the Seleka rebellion. So there, but back in 2008, there were these peace agreements, and then FOMUC was actually transformed into Mikopax, which was a bit of a stronger mandate in, in an effort to, to, establish, uh, to consolidate this uh, peace agreement. Now, these are two actually unrelated um, peacekeeping missions. So, sorry, it is a long list. Uh, so the Minur 4 and Euphor Chat RCA. So Minur 4 is Mission des Nations Unies on RCA, donc Central African Republic, et au Chad. So I talked to you about this regional um, instability, so this conflict between uh, Chad and Sudan, and the impact that this had on the border region with the Central African Republic as well. So they established here the Minur 4, and they were supported by an EU peacekeeping mission, uh, which was called Euphor. Um, yeah, whew, I don't know whether I'll discuss all of them. Uh, then, um, in 2000, yeah, so after the 2000, 2008 peacekeeping, uh, peace agreements, the UN also decided to scale up its political mission again. So from Bonuka, they went to Binuka. And in 2011, there was a mission of the African Union established in Eastern uh, Central African Republic to fight the LRA. So it was a regional force of the African Union, and they are supported by uh, American special forces. Uh, but that is actually something that is, of course, different from the current conflict dynamics that we kind of discussed today. Um, and then, in 2013, the Seleka could actually take power without too much uh, new de deployment of international peacekeeping missions. Uh, it was only when they were into power, uh, when they took power, and the anti-Balaka started to appear, and it, we started to have these ethnic clashes and this, this threat of maybe, as some said, a genocide, that the UN also started to take um, uh, action. And so in a Security Council resolution, they um, actually mandated the African Union to organize a peacekeeping mission, which was MISCA. And they also mandated France to um, go and enforce the peace in the Central African Republic. So there we actually have 2,000 French soldiers who went to the Central African Republic to enforce the peace uh, and to support MISCA. And then since 2014, MISCA actually, so the African Union-led operation became MINUSCA, was integrated in the new UN mission. And of course we have here some more EU missions of a very small scale. So on the one hand, the EU had a, had a small troop deployment in Bengi to secure the area, to stabilize the capital. And now they have a monitoring and advising mission. So, um, wow, just explaining it to you like this really makes, <laughs> makes for a, a long list of, of peacekeeping interventions. Um, okay. So uh, the Operation Sangaris, so that was actually so the French, the French force uh, who was there and still is there, but now that MINUSCA has been established, they are winding down. Um, so apparently what is, what is interesting is that, so of course the French uh, military is very active in a lot of conflict regions. So they're active in Mali, they're also active in Afghanistan, uh, in Iraq. But apparently the mission with the highest rate of post-traumatic stress disorder for the soldiers is the Central African Republic. And this would be linked to the fact that there is no clear adversary. So they have to try to impose themselves, to put them, to interpose themselves between warring groups of the population, and of course they, they arrived there very soon after the anti-Balaka staged this large-scale attack in Bangui, when, this when the entire capital really fell victim to this wave of violence and very, very explicit violence, and so this kind of contributed to, to um, yeah, a lot of distress for the military. Okay. 
I'm going to leave it there. So uh, MINUSCA, uh, it's the mission that was, uh, the UN peacekeeping mission was established in 2014. So it's the multidimensional integrated stabilization mission, which means that it's not only peacekeeping, but that there is also this support to the Central African Transitional Authorities to try to uh, reinstate uh, state stability to reimpose the rule of law. Um, and they have about 12,000 uniformed personnel, which might seem like a lot, but of course over uh, the Central African Republic is as big as France, so if you have to put them over this entire territory, it's actually pretty meager. Uh, so this is um, a, an image of the MINUSCA deployment. What we see is that m most of the troops are actually uh, from either from the neighboring countries. So we have here, these are all Cameroonian soldiers, so they actually guard their own special interest area. And then here we have the Congolese, of the Republic of the Congo, uh, the Congolese soldiers who are also based there where their natural interest lies. And then we have also the DRC. So the DRC, although they are themselves uh, hosts to a UN peacekeeping mission, uh, MONUSCO, they also participate in this, this mission in, um, in the Central African Republic. Uh, Chad was present in the former, like this regional African Union or regional, like the, the regional organization, the, the CEMAC. Uh, but because there were a lot of accusations from the local population that they would actually have been biased and that they would have been partisan and supporting the Seleka and especially the Chadian part of the Seleka or that they would be uh, protecting or also uh, protecting or giving weapons to the Muslim population so that they could protect themselves against anti-Balaka attacks. They decided to retreat from uh, the MISCA mission and then also from, from MINUSCA later on. Uh, so the mandate, of course, it's a very ambitious mandate and it is very difficult to implement given the fact that there is barely any functional security sector in the Central African, uh, Central African Republic, given the fact that there is barely any state authority. So protection of civilians is something that is uh, challenging. Uh, they have very little, uh, very few soldiers. Also, these soldiers, soldiers are often not really motivated to go and risk their own lives to secure the local population. Um, as you could have seen maybe here, the French military is also way better equipped and they also, they, they did engage with the Seleka, they did engage with the anti-Balaka. Um, and of course, they're they very well trained and, and uh, very disciplined. So there was a bit of a difference with the, with the, with the MINUSCA mission. Um, well, just so they have to, they have, of course, human rights promote the rule of law. Uh, there is no uh, justice sector anymore in the Central African Republic. Uh, there was barely any functioning justice sector before the Seleka came or the anti-Balaka, but when they came, they looted all the prisons, they demolished all the prisons, so there are no prisons. When somebody is arrested for having raped someone or for having looted or for having murdered someone, they are often actually already released the same day because there is no means to detain them. So there are huge uh, challenges for the Central African authorities and of course also for the international community and MINUSCA in trying to re-establish or establish this for the first time properly. Um, so they also have to disarm, demobilize, and reintegrate the armed groups uh, that are now there. So we have all these Seleka factions, we have all these anti-Balaka factions, which all have their leaders. And these leaders are often interested in having a political position in the capital or getting something out of their influence in the armed conflict. So for DDR is actually the process by which they try to entice these different armed factions to lay down their weapons and to either go back to a civilian life or to be integrated in the national army. Um, and this is something which is difficult to be done. If you, like in the DRC, start to integrate all these different armed factions in the national army, then you have a very ill-disciplined and fraction, fractured army. So that's, that's another big challenge that will be there. And then also, yeah, illicit exploitation and trafficking of resources. I can talk on for hours, but I won't. 
Okay, uh, sexual abuse is something that was in the media, so this is the last thing that I just wanted to touch upon briefly. Um, sexual abuse was something that is in the media, so um, not only the Sangari, so the, the French forces were uh, accused on several occasions of having uh, abused also m uh, children. Uh, what often happens, so also the, um, the MINUSCA mission, uh, those peacekeepers, what often happens is either, okay, there is prostitution, which is prohibited under UN regulations, so uh, UN peacekeeping personnel is not allowed to engage in any commercial sexual uh, transactions. But what they often do as well is, of course, you have these very weak people who are sitting in these IDP camps and who don't have any uh, means of eating in the evening, so it's very easy to offer them some, some candy or some soap or some very basic commodities in exchange for, unfortunately, sexual favors. Uh, and then there is, of course, this problem of impunity. Because on the one hand, these UN peacekeepers, they have to enjoy Im immunity in the country where they're serving uh, in order to be able to, to do their work independently. But on the other hand, this also gives them some kind of impunity when they, or a sense of impunity when they engage in, in these acts. So then it actually becomes the responsibility of the state who sent the troops once they are back in their country to really prosecute them and, and to uh, uh, convict them. So it is really a recurring problem. It's not only in Central African Republic, it's also something that played very uh, prominently in, in the DRC. Uh, and when you're working, when you're at, in, a Monusca, in, a, in a UN base, you see all these, these kind of posters like uh, calling all the, the personnel not to engage in uh, sexual abuse. And then because it's there, you can see if you engage in sexual abuse, you can be put on a plane and be sent back to your country. Um, so I don't know whether it makes a lot of, uh, <laughs> whether that's really a deterrent. Um, and so yeah, you have the conduct and discipline units. Uh, but uh, a very hopeful sign. So now just a couple of days ago, the UN Security Council uh, adopted a resolution uh, which would enable the Secretary General, because all peacekeeping missions depend on the Secretary General, the Secretary General could actually send entire contingents back to their country if within the contingent there would be um, systematic or widespread sexual violence. And if then, so the, the contributing countries are urged to then take action to investigate and to hold the perpetrators accountable, uh, and if they, don't do, if they don't take any appropriate action, then their entire, uh, so all their troops can be sent back to the country. And of course, a lot of those uh, troop contributing countries or African countries or India or Bangladesh or Uruguay, and for them it's actually an important uh, way to make st income. Uh, because for each soldier, the UN pays the contributing country a specific amount. Uh, so, of course, there is this financial incentive now also for these countries to really prosecute and to uh, make sure that these um, exploitations do not occur anymore. Thank you. <laughs> One more thing. Noblesse <laughs> oblige. Sorry. Um, my colleague organizes, uh, as together with some other people, a mapathon. Um, and of course, we've been, we've been seeing many maps, and a lot of areas, a lot of conflict areas, are not mapped at all. But NGOs and humanitarian organizations really depend on having detailed maps of roads and buildings in order to be able to plan their interventions. So, what the missing maps mapathon will be doing, so everybody is invited in our offices, very conveniently located around the corner, as I mentioned, um, is actually based on uh, satellite images to kind of digit to try to digitalize new map areas that are then used by, for instance, so this is actually an initiative that is being supported by Doctors Without Borders, by the International Committee of the Red Cross, and also by the Red Cross Federation, uh, because it's very useful for uh, NGOs and people, wor people working on the ground. So if you would have any interest um, in joining, it is, uh, yeah, the 23rd of March. Yeah, you can, you can send it along, and uh, drinks are on the house, because it's in Dutch, but maybe not everybody understands. So, okay. okay, thanks. All right, so first of all, I want to thank our speaker. It was a very interesting evening. I hope that everyone got a basic first idea of the very complex nature of the, the crisis, so thank you. Um, we brought you a small present as well. <laughs> 
And um, there you go. A warm applause for the speaker. So um, we'll be sending an email afterwards with, um, for ex first and foremost, uh, a request for your feedback, what you thought about our first event. We're eager to learn and to improve and hope to see you next time. We'll be sending uh, some information along as well. So we, for example, this will be sent as well. Uh, the link to the website we can provide as well. And uh, last, I can say that there's still some sandwiches left outside. So if you want, go ahead, take one. And please, uh, if you can, put your glasses outside on the table. Thank you very much. Uh, it was pleasant having you all here, and have a good evening. Thank you, and see you next time.